my record did not get released, but where fate had it was Carlos ended up hearing that song. Oye Como Van, my rendition. Right. Hey, everybody. You know, we have had so many amazing guests. We've had one of the most famous psychics in the world and Alison Dubois. We've had Sharon Lecter, literally the top financial literacy expert on the planet. We've had Lee Steinberg, who just signed and negotiated for Patrick Mahomes a half billion dollar contract, the largest football contract, and I believe sports contract in America ever. We've had all sorts of people that represent success. And what I'd like to talk about today with one of my favorite people on the planet, Andy Vargas, is the role of music and the role of vibration. When we talk about the law of attraction, the law of, in, of intention, and we've talked in some depth with Didi Wong, just a couple weeks ago about how that vibration, that ability to identify and be in sync with oneself and one's purpose is so important in life, but nothing embodies it more than music. And I just want to tell a quick story, which I told Andy I would on this show, which is how many years ago was this, Andy? Maybe eight years ago, nine years. Anyway, I'm in an elevator in the Mandalay Bay, just me and this Good looking guy who's, you know, looking pretty sharp. And he asked me about the ring. I'm not wearing the ring right now. I think I might run and get it actually. Um, and it was my Kansas City Chiefs Hall of Fame ring. And we started to talk and, and uh, there was a connection there. There was a vibration there. Sometimes I think you recognize those things. And uh, I was at a sports business conference in Las Vegas. And I invited him to a party at, what was that place called? The Light or something? Andy? Yeah, The Light, yeah. Yeah. And we kind of felt like uh, we were at a zoo, watching a human zoo of, of uh, many of you probably know how crazy uh, Vegas nightclubs can be. And just watching the phenomena, people, what they're wearing, how they're acting. And uh, and we sat back and just sort of watched this. And, and that's how we originally connected. But very quickly, we began to talk about Andy's incredible role as uh, lead singer, uh, they have two singers, but I always call Andy the lead singer uh, for oh, 20 years with one of the most famous bands in the world and uh, arguably the most famous, certainly one of the most famous guitarists in the world, Carlos Santana. Uh, and a band that has represented a remarkable variety of music and also has represented music at the highest level for decades and decades, starting perhaps on the world scene with uh, what ha happened at Woodstock, where this young, I think he was about 18 years old, uh, guitarist, Carlos Santana, brought in Hispan uh, and Hispanic uh, influence into music. And his story has been enormous. But, you know, when you are playing with Carlos Santana, um, you know, there is a lot of pressure on you. And I want to talk and introduce uh, one of the great young singers on the planet today, uh, Andy Vargas, not only because he's a great singer not only because he's a great musician but like most of the virtually all of the, our guests on the show he understands the notion of legacy the notion that you can take your success and spin it to where it needs to be which is also expanding your capacity to make a difference in the world so andy vargas lead singer for for santana for 20 years uh and uh incredible talent uh, on his own. Thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. Hey, thank you, Nick. I appreciate it. Appreciate it very much. Thank you for that very heartfelt intro. Well, I mean it. And, and you know, uh, we talk about vibration and here you were 18 years old back in the day, growing up in California. Tell us about that and how someone of that age, that tender age was able to uh, be noticed and also be surrounded by people that maybe educated you. So you broke into the business um, and were noticed quite quickly because you were uh, you were with RCA and Santana was with um, Arista, which was a sister record company. Uh, tell us about that and, and just the, the young talent, where you noticed your talent and um, what that meant to you, how that felt to you at the tender age of 17, 18. Hmm. Well, 
I was born in Watsonville, California, and ever since I was a child, I always had dreams. I'm a big believer in, in uh, you know, if you dream it, you can create it. And I always had a dream of, of uh, you know, going to Los Angeles and being in a recording studio and recording records and, you know, what those records, you know, felt like when you listen to them in headphones and being a part of that, creating that. And I just followed it. I just, I just believed it. I just, there was nothing that really changed um, or there, were, there was no doubt, right? And from one thing to the next, as a, as a child, things just, I was very blessed that I was introduced to uh, some people who, uh, you know, just started opening some doors and we have to walk through those doors and bring our heart and spirit through those doors. And uh, the doors just kept on opening up. It started out with- Was this still in the same place in, in California or was this in LA? So I was in Watsonville. Right. met a gentleman named Terry Melcher and Bruce Johnston and Carmel. Terry Melcher's Doris Day's son, Bruce Johnston from the Beach Boys. Oh, wow. They were my first, uh, uh, you know, mentors and uh, really the, the, the first door right. that opened. And uh, they, uh, we recorded music in Carmel in a beautiful Carmel Valley, you know, overlooking, you know, the, uh, the hills and the valley there. And the blessed soul, bless his soul and rest his soul. May he rest in peace, Terry Melcher. Um, he he just took me under his wing, introduced me to later on his good friend Lou Adler, and uh, um, also we, we met uh, um, some people in the record industry. I met some people in the record industry. He brought some people in. They listened to our music, and uh, the gentleman and his uh, then wife Ron Fair uh, uh, from RCA and A and R, big time A and R. From RCA Records, drove to Carmel, heard me sing, and you know, contracts take some time, but started sending over some contracts, and um, like, is this really happening? You know, like, I was uh, really, you know, excited and uh, um, kind of in a, in awe, but uh, you know, I, I just kept on, kept on uh, keeping my my eyes open and um, you know, dreaming, um, and uh, I ended up moving to Santa Barbara for a little bit of time uh, with uh, close to Bruce Johnson because he live, lives uh, still out in Montecito and I was out there in Santa Barbara. I went to the Sydney College for a little bit, but uh, um, not enough time to actually, uh, you know, complete, um, you know, any schooling there. I immediately, you know, I'd have to like leave, you know, on these odd days, you know, where I have tests and things to, to LA and stuff. And I, I made music like my priority, like about, but you knew that going in, didn't you? I did know that going in. Yeah, yeah, I did. And, you know, my grandfather was always like, you know, you should, you know, join the army for a few years. You know, you should, you know, stick in, in, in college, you know. I mean, he um, and, and, you know, he, he had he was he was right, you know, in his in his mind where, uh, you know, it would have been great. Uh, I did follow my path and I felt like there was a calling and I and I always have had a higher power. Um, that I've uh, followed um, and uh, you know so I moved to Los Angeles eventually and uh, there Ron Fair was introducing me to you know the world the production and, and, and recording um, uh, you know engineers music producers music writers and and we recorded a, a, a great record which still is in the RCA vaults at this time um, called Chasing Dreams and uh, kind of what this show is about i mean I, I think one of the things in that elevator when we first met is the notion that uh a purpose and a dream with a purpose is what helps us through all of the stuff that we're going through um i would i would love to hear a little bit more about that song and also um about the music just what what the music how you would describe your music if there was an andy vargas music before you met santana what was the genre? I mean, it doesn't have to fit in any category. What was just unique? What what inspired you and and just made you feel this is this is my vibration. This is my music. I appreciate that. So what I was doing was I was uh, I was really uh, into hip hop and DJing, 
Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, Ron Fair, my a &R, wanted to just bring all of the elements of everything that I was listening to at the time and um, mix that up with, you know, these songwriters that came in to help teach me, you know, the structure of songwriting and, um, you know, a, a professional pop song, what that is like with, you know, the mixes of, of, of my influences. And um, so I had, you know, like hip hop drums and, you know, drum loops were a big thing back then, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of R&B soul, a lot of so a lot of like R&B soul chords and, um, you know, R&B and Spanish chords, you know, are, are kind of the same. Yeah. You know, they, 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 they have a lot of the same sentiment and colors. So it blended well since I was raised in singing, uh, you know, Spanish music, like, you know, from mariachi to Spanish, you know, pop at the time or, you know, Spanish ballads and stuff uh, or just, you know, uh, you know, classical, you know, songs from our heritage. And, uh, you know, and then I loved, you know, like, you know, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, you know, I loved Black Soul. So right. I. I that just is what came out. So I would like sing R and B, then I'd sing in Spanish, and and it was funny because you know they allowed for it, but it was only like back then it was only like a couple lines that 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 like producers or writers or labels wanted to hear. So I, so I really a hint of of Hispanic influence, but let's not go too far at that point. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So one time, Ron. Uh, Fair and I, um, well, he actually showed up and he had ordered uh, like like a bunch of vinyl of like Santana, Malo, you know, Tierra, like all of the classic, classic old school Latin rock groups. And, uh, you know, my dad obviously was a huge, huge, you know, um, influence in me and, and, and shared all of these groups with me. But I was very excited that that my a &R and I were meeting like, you know, creatively in the same space. And so I started to sample a lot of that music and put it into my my rhythm. So I had a lot of Latin percussion layers, you know, and so that gave my music a different groove and uh, everyone really started to respond to that. And I ended up recording a, a, a version of my own called, uh, well, a version of my own of Oya Como Va, you know, the song that uh, Santana had had um, recorded of originally of Tito Puente. And um, that ended up being one of the songs that kind of pushed my whole album to the, to the you know, towards the end. And we were going to release that record that I believe the label wanted to release an original and didn't want to release a cover that was their deal with me for some time. So it was, a, a you know, somewhat of a political um, battle you know right. at the time uh, but uh, it did get that by the way just just the battle between the business decisions that uh you know you have to work through people that uh, are not really musicians they think they are perhaps uh but they want to make business decisions versus creative decision yeah uh, and being able to do that in a way where you still sustain your career you don't get painted as being hard to work with but you rightly want to be passionate about what you believe is the, your music well you're, you're really hitting the nail on the head nick uh and this is maybe I, I would say only maybe five times has someone understood it as good as that in my life because um that is the truth and seeing the other side is there is a business to it you know there is there are systematics there there is metadata you know now you know back then there were you know sheets of, of charts and things and stuff so you know and and i I understand, you know, when you put a million dollars in, in a marketing plan, you know, you got to it's got to be supported, even though it, if it doesn't work, it's got to be supported by something at the end of the day or else whoever allowed for that million dollars to go out it's canned, you know. So I, I get it, uh, um, you know, even though sometimes there there has there is there are I'd say 50 50, you know, chances to where if I'm going to roll the dice, I'm rolling the dice. To, I've rolled the dice to get here so far, you know, so I'm going to continue to roll the dice. And, you know, I believe and I still believe that um, that, uh, you know, the artist's heart to see the artist through. That's when you really get the 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 artists that are that have longevity, that are timeless, you know, because they challenged the metadata. They challenged, you know, the um, you know what what we consider science um, and, you know, and actually their heart, their gut, their spiritual intuition was right. And so 
the the people stand behind that because that's what we want you know we don't want the forces against us where we're, you know um we're constantly suppressed and said no to when we know we that that that's how the world was created through creativity so there is a double-edged sword and we have to work with that um and you know um my record did not get released but where fate had it was carlos ended up hearing that song oye como van my rendition right and it led to me auditioning for you know his for his band once his record you know skyrocketing and uh led to me joining his record was supernatural right yeah yeah so so Chester Thompson I don't know if you remember Chester he was the keyboard player uh -huh. uh, with Carlos for many years the organ player and one of the most blessed and talented keyboard players on earth uh, uh -huh. great friend of mine I really uh, feel like reaching out to Chester because I, I I love love him so very much he's a great big brother to me and they both heard it and, and I remember Chester was always like man Andy man Andy that's it you know and with all my music he we actually recorded stuff with Carlos Chester would always involve me um he and Raul Rico man they were my buds man they were my buddies well describe if you can because I like uh the idea that we all are sculpted in our sense of what we can and can't do like a kicker in an NFL game by those moments of truth lining up the field goal in a matter of a few seconds or a couple minutes yeah 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 and, you know and of course we see it and now TV shows like The Voice, et cetera, uh, American Idol, et cetera. But you're there and there's one of your idols, Carlos Santana, right? Describe that set, all the musicians there, the band right there. How was it set up for you to audition? Were you facing them? Was uh, Carlos in the audience? How is this, uh, what were the, the dynamics of, of this picture that you had to step into and, and convince them just with your talent that you belonged? So he had, uh a an office where it was you know like the santana management office right um uh, out in uh, san rafael and you get through the office and then to the right there's like all of you know kind of the, the the gear and merchandise and things in like a big warehouse and you keep on going back to an actual rehearsal room uh and i think like up the way there was like metallica had theirs on this in the same I'm pretty sure it was metallica James Hetfield. Yeah, uh, in the same uh, on the same street, you know. But right. you go you go back there, and and I and I, I get in there, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, Carlos is already talking to everybody, buzzing around. You know, we've got the crew and we've got the band all set up behind their instruments, around their instruments and stuff. And and Carlos gets up on the mic and says, "All right, this is Andy." Uh, and then you know, the my first, I think the first guy that came to me was his name was Brian Montgomery. He was our our monitor our guy you know that deals with all our, our monitors and stuff you know listen uh, listen back monitors and he was trying to hook me up and say this is your speaker man here's your mic all right be good Ch do check you know and how are you feeling i was nervous i was totally nervous i was uh um, look, looking around the room and the first smile i saw was my buddy raul he was the first first guy to smile at me and it was funny because his smile reminded me of the singer Javier Solis. You know, Javier Solis was like very clean cut. He was a, a Mexicano a vocalist that was also, a, you know, a movie star. And he had a very soft voice. I go, man, he looks, and his hair was, you know, parted and he was always clean cut, smoking a cigarette, you know, black and white, you know, movies and Hollywood movies, man. And Spanish. And Raul looked like Javier Solis. He looked over to me and he just gives me a smile. He goes, yeah. Right. And then he's on, he sits. And that he sits puts you, me. that puts you in a little better place, didn't it? Put me in a better place, made me feel comfortable. Um, and then we tried it once. And then I, I looked over to Carl Perazzo. Yeah. He looked at me and he goes, like, lift up your chest, do your stomach. And like, you know, get up there. Like, come on. Like, you know, no, no, uh, Walking in small, walking big, yeah. Let's go, you know, uh -huh. and uh, right. and that's and, and 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 still to this day, I talked to him the other day. He's like, man, you know, we got to do this. You know, we got to step it up. We got to make this big. Um, and 
yeah so I, those are the two you know uh, like feelings of of support you know that i had and carlos you know obviously he just just he just got right in the music like he always does and and then uh you know they made a decision after you know the few songs i sang to have me the next day i got a call to, to have me go out you know with them um and this is a guys this is a small piece of history in carlos's grand you know of course small piece of carlos's grand history uh but it was but in in mine it was like my introduction to come in and join you know the movement uh, the santana movement um which then led to you know so much and, and, and so many friends within you know the santana organization you know had a, met a great great friend who's still my good friend now his name's adam fells adam it is a uh, um you know behind the scenes with carlos but he was our tour manager at the time and he he and i would play guitar and have long talks in the buses and he, he'll make fun of me right now saying yeah and then there were two little birds around our heads you know um but we had that kind of relationship it was great so i made so many great friends uh there you know in the santana and you're 20 years old at that point so at that point yeah i was 20 and i had just turned 21 after i believe after the first run i had turned 21 because right. we did the first run then we went back to rehearse for like the next you know tour which was you know i think the the, the west coast you know right um yeah were you part of that super bowl halftime i i was yeah yeah I was. what was that like i mean that's you know several hundred million people watching at one time uh what was that that was in san diego right yeah that was surreal um beyonce i think was on stage with, with beyonce yeah and we sang my song by the way we sang my oya como va that was my I sang my verses and we did my version and then we ended up kind of switching from the, my version into you know the original that's how we used to do it for many years Carlos allowed for us to sing my version of Oye Como Va with my verses in there and everything wow. um, and and yeah Beyonce sang my second verse <laughs> you, know, it's cool. um, you know if you can get that to us we would love to put that you know on the show just to show this and b-roll of you on there if you have any of that just because you know, think about that 20, 21 years old and in front of hundreds of millions of people on the stage, no second takes. That's the other thing that, that I connect with is, you know, as a kicker, you can't go, Mr. Referee, I'm not feeling right now. Can we take a time out? I don't think I want to smoke a cigarette or, you know, I want to take a drink. And, you know, the wind's not right. No, you got to get it done now. And no one cares. No one wants any excuses. You know, your voice is tight. You know, no one cares about that. So I, what I'd like to do now is um, talk about performance, Andy. You know, everybody watching may not think of themselves as performers, but the truth is whether you're performing for your kids and showing your best or worst, whether you're performing in the sense that you are presenting uh, a product or you're presenting yourself and what you, who you are every day, especially during adversity. Uh, we've talked about how Theo Epstein the general manager for both the Boston Red Sox when they when they won their World Series and then with the Chicago Cubs two different uh, times when he broke through curses and he said the second time around he said this to me personally a few years ago he looked for players that uh, brought the team together when the team was at its worst it wasn't just about their batting average who are the guys that that step up like Carparazzo you know you were saying was saying step up think big uh, Marcus Allen saying, you know, act like you've been there before. So let's talk about performance. Uh, what are some of the things that you've learned from Carlos Santana? You've learned from the band, like Carl and some of the other members of the band. Um, uh, Chester Thompson, for instance, uh, and, and also just from yourself uh, in your own career. What are some of the insights? Uh, and also, what is how exciting is that to perform, whether it's at, and we'll get a little ad for this because you are going to be coming back soon. Uh, we hope to um, reasonably soon to the House of Blues at the Mandalay Bay. But, you know, there you're performing in front of maybe a couple thousand people. What about when you're in, in front of 50,000 people? Tell us what that's like. What is that like when you have to do that night in, let's say, 50 dates in 60 days? Well, it, it's um, it's the most amazing experience. I miss it so very much to, uh, you know, have someone come and look at you in the eyes and say all right all right got about five 
five minutes or all right we got about 10 seconds all right then you know you go like i mean the smaller venues for a very high elite crowd are the most um nerve-wracking uh, really but, um, yeah yeah those are the most nerve-wracking for some reason but um because there's a lot of a lot of um uh, there's a lot of wait hurry to wait you know and finally when it's there you're like what is it really here but uh you know i, I gotta say something i'm i'm grateful to have been around guys that shrug that stuff off their shoulders man yeah. they just like they're like musicians they like it's all about the groove the yeah. move the vibe yeah. and and then i you know when i used to be like god man you know what here we go come on let's go and then and then i used to look at like my buddy raul he used to look at me all right let's go we're gonna go like i was like whoa this guy's like they are magical and then they get up and kill it because it's yeah. about the confidence in self but not just that it's not about being like i'm badass it's about like i enjoy what i do whether it's a it, gift it's a gift who you know, gets to play in front of fifty thousand or eighty thousand people who gets that uh, you know and, and so you know it's like and always having fun always with a smile on your face and you know i mean not to mention it does it does help when you're doing it night after night and then you go and you're in like a very very you know you're on like the amas or the grammys which we've done dozens and dozens of times you know it helps because we just came from you know rocking you know fourteen thousand, you know crowd audience you know venues and stuff audience venues and stuff and so like we show up to the you know grammys and we're like no problem what we got to yeah. get for this you know and we just got to wait and do camera yeah. blocking that helps i'm not lying but the um there is there is a gift to where you know i know look it's carlos himself is a master at this because it's him it's his show it's his name it's his it's it's everything you know he does he goes through a lot while the band kind of can be kicking back a little bit he's got to do a lot of press he's got to do a lot of a lot of stuff and sometimes the band does some of that stuff as well but generally speaking there's a lot of responsibility on his shoulders as well that he carries that i see him you know always with a smile and always ever since i was you know a kid with him uh you know he would always you know at that time i was just having fun like at that time i was just like wow this is great let's have a great time you know i'd call people hey, i'm going on right now man check it out you know and i'd have fun so there's something there was an innocence there you know and i think carlos really enjoyed and enjoys that innocence i mean because i and i still generally speaking i always you know i always feel that way sometimes when life gets outside of the music and outside of the performance when life gets crazy when you've got you know uh, i don't know an angry girlfriend or a you know yeah. uh, a situation going on like you know yeah. a sickness at home right before the you're game. Supposed to oh yeah then your mind's just not like all in it you know so i mean those are some liberties that uh, you know uh I don't always have anymore because then my, I didn't have as many responsibilities as I do now. Yeah. But um, so that you know, I'm that you, we got to learn. We got to learn how to how to how to you know how to deal with that. And it, the, we just got to always be centered. And for me, it's to be God centered. You know, it's like if I'm God centered when it's happening, then I'll know not to like you know just be like you know what, forget it about it, man. I'll, I'll talk to you later. I don't care. Like boom, and then I'll feel bad my soul won't be clear before I get up. Yeah. My spirit yeah. will be free before I get up. So I'll have my head spinning yeah. when I'm supposed to be like way in, you know, another world on stage or, you know, and that's how the, 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 the mistakes happen, you know? So, um, you know, I, and I've, and I've learned that, that it's about, it's really about how your day goes before the show, before you get on to make it like, be like groovy. Yeah. Tell us about a little bit more when you say Carlos, had all that stress and he's i think 75 now is that right and uh his wife is the drummer and she's amazing uh, i mean i'm talking i'm i have a background as a drummer and I, I look at great drummers and she is extraordinary she's got a little bit of a jazz influence and she can handle everything but it must be a little bit different but here he has handled all the different levels of ups and downs and personalities and changes in the band and then all having to do the you know each place having to do interviews etc tell us as you look at carlos santana andy vargas lead singer and you see this man now it's it's part of what you've done for 20 years but what observations would you draw about what it is that carlos has done to remain centered 
uh, in the midst of all that so that the music always comes first. He definitely has a reverence and he definitely has a spirituality. He doesn't say a lot during a concert, but when he does, it's all about light. It's about forgiveness. It's about reverence. Uh, it's about bringing out the best energy. It's about uh, the human spirit and the oneness of all of us. Um, you know, tell us what you witness with this uh, icon of music that has allowed him to, to continue. I, I, and I'm going to bring that up again with the Beatles. Here they had eight, nine, whatever it was, years. Whereas the Rolling Stones, you know, 50 years. Santana, 50, 55 years, whatever it is. Uh, Def Leppard, 40, 50 years. Some bands figure it out. What has Carlos Santana figured out? And in your own relationship with him, tell us what that's like. First, let me let me do a quick plug. Hello, sir. Okay. I'm gonna plug uh, the uh, Cindy Blackman album, "Give okay. the Drum Some," <laughs> which uh, talking about Cindy and, and her drumming. She's um, incredible. Let me participate on that album gratefully. Awesome. So, and it's a lot Cindy of fun. Blackman. Yeah, Drum. Cindy Blackman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's uh, amazing. People in the band too, by the way. You know. Female in the band. We also try to talk about this, you know, role models that cross the gender, whatever it is, stereotypes and break through just with their talent. Mm. Uh, so, you know, and I know Carlos now these days, you know, he goes and, and, and plays, you know, along with Cindy. It's a it's a fun, you know, play uh, uh, that they have on stage. Um, but I mean, Nick, you said everything, man. You said, you know, through with reverence and and, you know, um, a lot, you know, peace. There's a there's a peaceful state, you know, um, and that I that I've always watched him have, you know, uh, through any kind of you know production difficulty or whatever. He just kind of rolls with it. One time, we were on stage at the House of Blues, and the um, the sound went out on stage. All we had were the monitoring <laughs> system, and we kept on going, man. We kept on going. Raul went like this, and, and Carl Carlos went like this. That means go. So we went on and we performed for the you know for the audience and we had a standing ovation at the end even awesome. though the sound went out for them it was still on the stage so they could hear yeah you know the the, the monitors and stuff so it, you know it's it's just about like you know get up and, and 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 leave it all on the stage you know there's a there's a um an excitement to get on stage because once you were done you know you feel relaxed and all right that was a good day that was a good show we let it left it all on the stage and you know got to make sure we get ready and get rest for the next one but um you know you know to i hope i mean you really answered your own question right there with all of the things and you said about carlos that's really it those are the things that i see in, what about in the impact he has on you and everyone else in the band to me i ended my show uh recently but just saying you know the hard thing for all of us is if we can do the work daily with discipline to link brain to heart and brain to heart brain to heart and soul and so that, why do they call it soul? So when you know you're linked in that place, that's where your music comes from. That's human music, the music of the human spirit. When we work with homeless people, you know, you can still feel that music. And that's why we have amazing musicians. Although right now we, we will be severely limited because of the, the COVID uh, rise here in Phoenix, California, et cetera. But um, the music brings out for homeless people that have had nothing going in their favor for so long and you see uh with the help of that vibration that harmony uh that these layers of pain strip away and that's what i've seen when i've gone and you've been kind enough to host me there at the house of blues i really i'll never forget it brother man you just see people given permission to to hear this music inside them you know and where bliss happens that's another interesting um stereotype you know it's an overused word a cliche bliss find your bliss but really that's what i find that carlos perhaps and santana and you understand is that's what you're trying to give to the audience that sense that life is bliss you have a choice in the midst of everything to find that bliss yes um we do have a choice i think the band what carlos as a leader uh, we follow that uh, that pr projects to the audience and we have to find it within ourselves because you can't give someone you don't something you don't got you know you have to uh, you know be honest and true to self and, and bring that purity out and that's what we I think we focus on as a band 
you know, is that and life changes and there's life struggles and stuff. And, and, you know, we try to manage. I try to manage that so then I can have a beautiful show, whether it be with Santana, you know, or on my own just singing. You know, my son this morning, you know, he's really how old is he? Uh, my Nico is uh, turning four. Yeah. And um, I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. He, he just he just turned four. Um, but uh, he is re he really loves this, this this song by Justin Bieber called uh, like a lonely or something. Yeah. And, and uh, he just he just sings. He's, he like he, he asks Alexa to play it all the time. And he sat down. He was looking at me and, and he was just singing it. It's that vulnerability. You know, because he could, I could have put a camera on him and it would have made someone cry. Like the way he was connecting to it. And he says, dad, you know, he's, he doesn't have God in his heart. And he's saying, talking about how he's going to have God in his heart. And I'm like, wow, son, you know, like that is a very pure understanding of what you're listening to. And, and that's really, really it, especially in these days. And this time to have God in our heart is so important right now. Whatever higher power you have, because if we, I believe if we, if we put the belief and faith in these entities that, you know, are making, creating laws for us and stuff, if we believe, if we, you know, in all these, these things, we don't believe in our own higher power um, to keep us and our family, you know, safe, then um, we'll be lost. Yeah, you know, we've done um, five events testing the homeless and veterans uh, in April, May, and June. And um, and then other events we've done where we served on Thanksgiving, two events, 900 homeless. I've never worried. I've always felt that this is where I'm supposed to be. And it's it's funny but i just don't have fear about that i've been tested seven times god bless so far <laughs> i've been fine uh and i just think when you're doing it for the right reasons that's the thing is you're doing it for the right reasons and so uh and i will say a comment in terms of the crowds and you know whether you're feeling nervous or whether you're feeling focused and centered um after a while the crowds kind of disappear you know on the football field the same thing they can't help me kick now there are times when you'll hear things and if you're on the sidelines and you're a kicker they're going to say some wonderful special things that you might not have had to hear <laughs> you know at the raiders stadium for instance you know all designed to knock you off your game but you know it comes with practice etc so um tell tell us and tell our listeners andy vargas and santana the work because that's the other thing I noticed is that you put in the work, you have your rehearsals, you change the music, you change the order of songs, you put in new songs, you take out old songs, you keep it fresh. That's crucial. And, and I think um, Carlos is at once a priest uh, of the music, the, the beautiful spirituality that brings out uh, our best in music. But he also has to be, as we talked about at the very beginning, a businessman where there is the hard work, the daily discipline. Tell us about that. How how do you go about that? Is there sort of a an unwritten rule for all of you that this is just the work is is the most important thing to guarantee that you are where you need to be? Well, yeah, I think, you know, we do rehearse a lot. We rehearse almost every day uh, and before every show. You know, there's sometimes when we don't, but most of the time we rehearse before every show and um, for hours, new music. There's always new music Carlos uh, is with sometimes daily. And, uh, you know, I've I enjoy uh, flexing that skill to, you know, uh, digest a song before a show and then be able to get on and or rehearse it. Sometimes just do it. You know um and and you know i take that skill and and utilize it in, in in my own personal solo careers uh so um that is a big part of of preparing to get up and and and, and just create a timelessness on stage oh you wow know? that's a great word what do you what does timelessness mean to you it's like getting up on stage and and all of a sudden turning around and it's over you're like what happened 
there was no time it just it just you know you the spell a, a warp zone and just yeah. something just, and everything was right everything was perfect and you look at each other you're like everyone says yeah yeah great <laughs> cool you know that's what's it. the what, what is the what are uh, give us two memories of the biggest audience you ever played in front of or the just the funniest thing that ever happened whether it's at mandalay bay at the house of blues or whether it's somewhere in europe or wherever else you perform tell us for instance where is the farthest place oh, from america that you performed oslo norway uh -huh. um, johannesburg south africa and how, how do those crowds vary or do, is there sort of a link because of the love of your music? Do yeah, those it, crowds really vary or do they feel kind of strangely similar? Um, well, the, the color of the audience, you know. <laughs> Oslo, South Africa. You know, um, but surprisingly enough, it's always very, very, uh, there's always a rainbow of color, you know. Uh, Carlos brings, you know, everyone together in his music um you know the some so, god nick i've had so many funny experiences of uh you know like running off stage and having to use the restroom and being in oh, a, yeah. i've been where, there where we were at we were at like you know we were at a um uh oh we were at a casino somewhere in the some indian casino somewhere i think in canada and they warned us but I thought I'd be cool and I jumped off with just enough time to like, you know, cause in your mind, you know, right. And I'm listening, the clock is the music. So I'm running off and I jump out of a door, it shuts. And, you know, I'm like, I, I go, you know, do my thing. I come back, try to open up and it's locked. <laughs> you know what I had to do was run all the way around. I didn't even think twice. I just did it. I just went all the way around and I'm like, and I'm asking people, I'm like yelling, how can I, this door work, this door work? No, nope, you gotta go through the front. So I go all the way to the front. I didn't even have my pass. I go, I'm the singer and I was using the restroom and I'm locked out. And so I had to run from the front of the, you know, the entry <laughs> where everyone's coming in all the way around. And I got stopped, <gasps> it was like, and I went up and I don't know, God, how I did it. It's because I was so fast, you know, I was just moving kind of like a, you know, like an MMA fighter, like fast, like, not even one second. So like in two minutes, you know, I can get so far. Right. right. And, and I made it all the way to and what, what took me the time was going behind the stage. So no one, cause I didn't want to go on the stage and cross over because I'd be like, Oh, actually, no, I take that back. I did have to go up. I, I, this has happened maybe once or twice, uh, or more than once, excuse me. And I've had to go behind the stage and, I, and like, you know, there's all these wires, man. So you gotta like, and I'm in, it's dark complete yeah, black it's only dark the wires you know and, and i'm and i'm trying to get my way but this time i was actually I, I went on carlos's side and went up so he saw me and then you know i went and i just kind of jogged to my mic so there was notice that you know that i somehow was not there you know in proper time but no one knew i had to run all the way around the darn venue to get in that was a uh, oh gosh you know <laughs> some that was a um you know one of the funny memories i have of what, what about uh the audience itself has there been anything strange in the audience somebody uh that's you know somehow connected with or did something any any strange anecdote like that uh so many so <laughs> many of the audience is like you know i mean we're talking we're talking you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, you know, we're talking over millions of people, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. um, but, uh, you know, I'm the same with you, buddy, you know, but, uh, um, you know, sometimes you have a connection. Sometimes there's, you know, you see people that you haven't seen forever. You're like, wow. Sometimes there's like, you know, a, a mother and a daughter, a father and a son, and you can tell, and they're like, they're bringing in, you know, they're, they're the new generation that makes me emotional man because they're like the, the parents they really have been affected you know some some people come to me and they're like man my dad brought me to my first antenna concert and i've been coming ever since and you you know you are just you know such a great addition and, and man I'm, I'm so proud to be talking to you right now and i want to introduce you to my son and then and there's a the new generation i'm like yeah yeah like this 
this is big you know this this what's happening here what i'm involved with in this lineage you know in this you know what they did before the the forefathers before me you know greg greg raleigh yeah you know, michael carabello michael shreves you know carlos and the guys like they did something that affected the world that you know kept the gen the generations coming you know and to be a part of that to have been a part of the celebration you know the santana four album um yeah. and then you know to be called the supernatural band after that you know on, on the same stage you know to be in the bay area to have like the bay area who who were the core fan base you know california bay area the, the, the core fan base for this group because this is where they were from come out and give them love and support and then see all the generations and i mean this is where i'm from so like you know as far as my town watsonville is concerned you know i joined like the probably the most prominent band i could have joined you know um from a respect level you know in the area and stuff so i mean that's amazing you know um obviously i felt i was in the right place because of carlos himself and but you stayed with it. You stayed with it. That's the thing is there've been a lot of turnover here and there with the band. I mean, five years is a long time in the music world and you've been there with the same band for 20 years. What do you think has been the uh, the secret or just in the essence of that, that Carlos and you and the band, you stayed with it for 20 years, almost unheard of time. Oh, I think family, I think, um, you know, uh, you know, I, I, my mom asked Carlos to be my, my godfather in music, you know, when I first joined the band and he's always proven to, to, to be that, you know, I mean, there's been so many um, times when I know, I know I've stepped up and I know he depends on me to, you know, to, to, to grab the ball like a quarterback. And he put a lot of, a lot of trust in me. He really, really did. And, uh, and I'm just so grateful to that because it, it made me really be like, all right, it's time to do this. You know, this is, this is time to, uh, um, you know to step up and i've had many opportunities to do so and god willing i feel like i've done a great job um so you know we, this is what we pass on this is what this is what we what i want my youth and my you know i work with youth um and let's talk about that because you know from the beginning we talked about that and how so so many people miss that opportunity while they are successful to dig deeper, to double down on that success by sharing it with the next generation. That's all you've been talking about here the last few minutes. And it was such a blessing for me, I have to tell you, brother. Such a blessing to watch you and to talk with you and then to see you follow through and create this music school for, for youth, for youth that would never have had that opportunity. Tell us about that because everybody listening, I don't care if it's one person, it could be yourself, by the way, taking care of yourself for the first time in your life, but everybody can impact one person every single day. And you started this music school. Tell us all about it, please. We, we um, I started a, a music program in 2015 in San Bernardino, uh, where we, uh, worked with kids uh, out there that were interested in production, songwriting, um, and you know the the technology of music creating today. And um, I brought in you know my music uh, partners and musician friends to come in and help mentor and teach and just inspire. You know, each one has something that they've given me. Each of my friends have a special gift they've given me even if it's laughter sometimes. Sometimes there's, you know, a band member that just, I love having him around because he's funny, you know? That's it, you know, and obviously they play amazing, but they just make you laugh, you know? Because everyone could, you know, there's so many musicians out here in LA, they, you know? So, but I've got a, a lot of funny guys and and um, and, and very uh, big hearted guys um, and, and friends. So I brought them around and, um, and and I just, I opened the world to Andy, of Andy Vargas to, to the kids. Uh, since then, um, you know, I've I put on uh, some fundraisers in my hometown. I focused on my hometown of Watsonville right. to, uh, to do uh, scholarships for, for kids uh, graduating, going into college. Uh, and, um, and also uh, for my dad's, my dad is a, a music teacher. Now uh, we are teaching uh, voice to uh, his his school of, of, of kids uh, via via Zoom, you know, so I do this exact same thing. I'm like right here, 
um, with the kids, you know, um, actually we, we, we have that a little later today. Um, this process we're opening up to the, um, uh, you know, to Los Angeles and, and, and the greater um, public very, very soon, um, you know, coming soon next year. This year was a transition. Uh, we also have a music um, donation uh, and uh, soon uh, we're, we'll be refurbishing instruments as well. But uh, we uh, we're just uh, in a collaboration with Gibson Guitars. We have instruments to um, to award and, and donate uh, children who we feel, you know, are deserving uh, of whatever the situation is. Every situation is different. Um, and How many so children are you, are you working with right now? Uh, currently, we have, I think, um, we have around 15 kids that are on and off on the voice program. Uh, we've given about eight different scholarships, eight two-year scholarships. Uh, and uh, we're working on the scholarships for this next upcoming year. So, like, we, you know, we have the second year for the ones we gave last year and stuff and um, coming up. So, um, you know, it's the uh, Andy Vargas Foundation College uh, Scholarship, College, uh, you know, Scholarship Award. Um we so then i have to say uh if we're talking more about you know not just in my voice music class um you know we are working with around 25 to 30 different kids in different facets you know um, um and it, it's been interesting because we you know i want to take the world on but we only have so much time in a day so we um or have to expand a little bit because uh, I have some new classes that I'd like to provide for for kids to um, and I uh, am you know through here in my home studio uh, just uh, you know running the um, the programming uh, for all of these classes and the you know um, the instructors and, and things I have one in the music business like 101 that will start giving some of the kids so they can help you know uh, record and publish their own material uh, we are working on publishing the 2016 um, album. I know it's been uh, you know a few years since then, but it's an, it's an amazing album of the kids. We just had some uh, a few different uh, licensing hurdles, uh, but uh, that'll be coming out as well as um, an album with uh, our current voice students now with my dad. Uh, COVID kind of uh, put a little bit of a um, uh, just a little you know. Um, slow down the wheels on, on getting together to report on that. And it must be wonderful working with your father too. No, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. It's great. You know, both he and I, like, you know, we, we know as we build our curriculum, what is so important. Like we'll spend, you know, two classes just on breathing. You wow. know, and the kids are just like, you know, okay. You know, and we're like, listen, you know, if we want to, if you want to, you know, play a professional football game, I'm going to put you in the training room. I'm going to put you on the field and I'm not going to give you a football, you know, until, you know, until we train. Yeah. We you know, and even before we get out there, you know, even before I put you in an, in an, uh, an auditorium to sing, I'm going to train you in, in, in a, in a swimming pool on how to breathe and how to time you're breathing to different rhythmic patterns. Wow. And where do you put your breath when you breathe? Wow. Where is your air going? You know, yeah. can you sustain your air? And if so, for how long? You know, and things like that. You know, those things are really, really important that um, every every student must must understand. You know, and also what does breathing do? Not just give you you know strength and support of your voice, but you know, the it, it, it relaxes you. You know, so my dad talks a lot about that. You know, and that. And it's really important to focus in on those kind of things. And so the kids that, that hang on are, are, are in for a ride, I'll tell you. Because, um, you know, I used to always kind of be like like fidgety and looking around and, you know, while my dad was talking to me personally. <laughs> the piano, and then he'd be, all right, let's go. You know, and then he'd put a mirror next to me and we'd look at our, you know, at our mouth. He'd have me look at my mouth when I'm doing voice exercises and things. And I used to think it was silly. I want to be honest with you. I used to, when I was a kid, I used to think it was silly, um, but it was not. It helped support, you know, my the foundation that uh, of who I am now and, and and my skills that I carry now. You know, uh, with COVID, of course, which attacks the lungs, breathing is so important. I think of my friend, actor Kerry Tagawa. Most important thing he does in conditioning is breathing and how it centers him as well. Um, two things before we let you go. Um, number one, uh, anybody that uh, has been listening, I know, 
has got to feel that uh, there's some resonance literally to Andy and his message and his mission. So if you'd like to contribute to the Andy Vargas Foundation, is there a special name for your music school? Uh, just the Andy Vargas Foundation. Yeah. yeah, you can go to andyvargasfoundation.org and there you could find all the links for donation, PayPal, uh, Venmo, any, you know, um, all of the information. But, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of going back and forth, uh, um, you know, as far as for the classes that we're taking is that we're, my dad and I were like the Vargas voice, you know, and, uh, you know, classes, you know, Vargas voice instruction or something, but, um, you know, it's been, it's been great to be, to, you know, to be able to be a, a leader in, in, in this, um, you know, um, as we know, you know, a foundation is, is hard work. And so, you know, it takes a lot, my you know partner, Elvia Barboa does a lot, a lot of work for the foundation, and she keeps the uh, you know nuts and bolts running. It can't happen without her. Um, but volunteers, uh, brother and sisters out there, you know, volunteers. Uh, I am so blessed, uh, Champions for the Homeless, to have musicians that I don't even have to. I just have to give them the date, and they show up. There's something about the the connection. This is what I wanted to finish on. It's the connection between the healthy spirit and creativity and if we have uh if we have a line and connected with and know what it feels like to have been creative from our source i wrote a poem last night it always puts me in a special place and the musicians seem to get that and the volunteers champions for the homeless has grown from 25 volunteers to 500 guess what we'll only be able to have five on christmas but we'll have some more the two days before organizing these packages i know the musicians get that i know the creativity so Andy Vargas, lead singer for 20 years and, and a leader because you take your success and you do something with it. You take your success and you help others, the next generation, even maybe some that are older than you, remind them what really matters in life. What is creativity to you? What is what is creativity in your life? What has it done for you? Uh, it, it's what, what I, every morning, the thought of being able to create just starts my morning off with a blessed day after I meditate and, uh, you know, make my gratitude list, pray. Uh, I don't always have the luxury I used to with kids, but, uh, you know, creativity for me fills my soul, you know, music and being able to get lost during this time of COVID, I know what's going on out there. I mean, it's not going on in here. You know, I respect and love it. Uh, you know, I, I respect and, and love, um, you know, being able to be here. And, and, and I respect what's going on outside in the world. But it's such a blessing to like, you know, sit in here and play the piano and sit in here, and listen to records, sit in here, you know, and create and write a song or collaborate, you know. I'll never stop doing that. No matter what happens in life, I'll never stop doing that. You know, I'll be hundred years old and you'll still be doing it. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, yeah. you know, I mean, you know what it is. You write poetry. Thank you for your messages. You send me messages sometimes. I'm like, wow, man, this stuff is deep. This stuff is good. <laughs> There's a song around this stuff, you know? Well, um, we might have to do that. That would be awesome. I'm down, Nick. Okay. Down. That's what I do. Brother, you are such a special man. And everybody, I think you can tell that there's a reverence. It's not an ego. It's someone that has found a sanctuary. That background where Andy is, that's one of his sanctuaries. I, I pray for all of you that have watched this, that in, in pursuing the creative, we unlock new pathways through the traumas of our lives and over them and around them to who we were always supposed to be with God's unique gifts, everybody being different. No one's going to be Andy Vargas. No one's going to be Nick Lowry, but they're going to be unique to who they are. And that sanctuary then as a place, but also building that, that's something inside that no one can take away. Uh, Andy Vargas, you have given us a wonderful reference and reminder of what really matters in the Christmas season. God bless you always as my friend, but also for 2021, may, may we find new creativity, new gifts, new music in our hearts and souls. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nick. Love you, brother. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Thank you. And everybody out there, just remember, as we always say, it's not the intensity of the spotlight on you. It's the brightness of the light within you. God bless you.
thank you.